Hi, everybody. I think speaking about distributed governance is uh, it's a difficult topic because it's one of the most complex topics I could imagine. So everything what I was speaking about is nothing else than a try to conceptualize uh, a direction uh, which we might be able to use to uh, work towards distributed governance. And yeah, I just get right into it. For me, the original inspiration of Ethereum was a network which gives us the ability to create permissionless systems where everybody is free to join, where everybody can participate, uh, and where everybody uh, is equal in the right to participate. So the madness of power, I think corruption of power, or say the situation that many, many, many people depend on one single other human being um, is a risk we introduce uh, based on the history where we come from. And today we have individuals which have thousands and thousands, uh, uh, like, like immense more po potential for destruction than uh, I have or you potentially have. And when I say that, it's a little bit populistic, but I think you're getting the idea. It's the risk we have that those decision makers make bad decisions. Bad decisions which are uh, catastrophic for all of us. Um, and I think it is desirable to find new ways of decision making. And the direction of distributed governance is hopefully a way forward to this. My background is in network engineering and IT security. So I think I understand uh, a little bit of what Ethereum is and what blockchain is doing. And when I say a little bit, I find it just so amazing how much growth we had in the ecosystem, how many second layer solutions are developed. And it's very hard to keep up with all the innovation which is happening, uh, while at the same time taking a lot of attention to the place of social governance and the human aspect. Uh, I'm currently engaged in uh, a security related project with the Ethereum Foundation as well as with Swarm. Uh, the other project, which is more volunteering project, which brought me here, is uh, the Digo Foundation. Um, and uh, the companies I uh, created last year, uh, which are operating in a blockchain space in Block.io. As a disclaimer, uh, this is an opinionated talk. I do not claim that this is academic or objective. I think it is pretty hard to do something like that. Um, so I hold strong opinions, lightly. And this is a state dump, which means that the state is, as you know, changing all the time and it's dynamically updated. So if we see us here in a year again, it will be a, probably a very different from now. To give an overview, um, I will speak about context in the beginning of the talk. I will speak about principles, which I think uh, can help us to build uh, the foundations for complex systems we can use to build distributed governance systems. I will speak a little bit about the DIGO Foundation and what we do there to embody the complexity we need to build viable systems. I will speak about the relationship of distributed governance systems and uh, permissionless blockchains like Ethereum. And I will speak obviously about uh, distributed governance and conceptualizations in this direction. If you have clarifying questions, just uh, raise your arm if it's a short one. If uh, it's a longer one, uh, please collect them and uh, let's have a short uh, talk after uh, this, this uh, speech. So let's start with a little bit of context. We have more and more technologies on the market which are actually supporting each other, which means that we have more and more abilities to influence the world. We have more and more impact. The problematic aspect of this is that if our decision-making uh, making power is not getting wiser or more considerative, we just make more and more, uh, we make bad decisions which have a stronger impact. And this is actually a, a self-terminization uh, uh, self in the longer run. If we don't find a way to change our decision-making to be way, fundamentally way better. So we have the power of gods because we start to fly to the skies and to the stars. We start to inhabit other planets in the foreseeable future. But without the wisdom and love, we make exponentially bad decisions. Humans, uh, some people say they don't change. 
uh, actually humans, I think, are programmed to change and to adapt. They are highly adaptable. That's the reason why babies, when they are born, are so vulnerable, because they're in a very uh, strong adaption state. They're in a state where they learn a lot from the environment to be highly adaptive. That's the reason why humans live pretty, uh, on, on pretty much every area of this planet, uh, in addition to that we start to fly to space. At the moment, we are grown in a society which is rivalrous and which is playing win-lose games, which means that this is how we act by default, because we are adapted to this environment. The problem is with win-lose games, which were very successful in the past, we come to a limit which we cannot satisfy anymore because the win-lose games we play result potentially uh, in catastrophic outcomes which destroy the playing field. If we speak about exponential growth, uh, then this is something which happens in nature as well. If a woman is pregnant, uh, the child grows exponentially, it takes exponentially more resources from the mother uh, until the point that the child uh, traumatically changes the way it's depending to become self-dependent. So the child is born and then it started to breathe on its own, it started to take uh, in food from uh, external instead of through the mother. And I think this is pretty similar to what we as a species need to do. We have a planet, we are exponentially extracting the resources. And if you're not substantially changing the way how we interact with those resources, uh, the child and the mother will die. In this case, uh, it's very important for us to find ways that we can do a, a, a fundamental shift in a way how we are interacting with our environment. So the basic underlying question uh, which brought me into the blockchain space was are there solutions we can use to collaborate on a totally new level uh, with the technology uh, we have at hand with blockchain technologies. I believe that developing this open source, developing this with low hierarchies or flat hierarchies, this is an expression of the wish to uh, collaborate, an expression of the wish that we are actu uh, actually uh, um, working together to, uh, uh, to have a win-win situation instead of a win-lose game. So I think it's really the transition from being rivalrous as we adapted to become collaborative and omniconsiderative so that we try to take as much into consideration as we can before we make a decision. There is this uh, sentence or quote from Buckminster Fuller, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. So it's not taking the win-lose dynamics and what we know and take it on the blockchain. This is creating a hyper-capitalism. It makes it way more like, effective, but I think this is not personally not what I'm searching for. I hope that we can make better decisions. So the question is, what are the new systems we actually need to build instead of just taking the old systems and making them even faster? That's the reason why I bring up principles. You might disagree with those principles or you might agree with them. I state them because I believe, I deeply believe that they are fundamentally important. We have in a blockchain states, uh, in, a, in a blockchain space, many people which actually look deeply into how they can avoid potentially legal um, prosecution. And uh, on one side, I understand it. On the other side, I say we need to be accountable to something. I don't say that we should all be accountable to certain jurisdictions. What I'm saying is maybe we should start to hold each other accountable and to call each other out on each other's bullshit. And I think this is very important because when we create new digital territory where we live in, then we need to think about how we can ensure that this is a territory which is uh, for people in a way that they can actually uh, have a predictive future in this space. Um, and that we ensure that it's not ab heavily abused uh, for uh, cases which are not in line with principles. What we see in nation states through constitutions, I think we will see similar things in a blockchain space. Uh, and just to say that there was a reason why there was a DAO fork and that reason was um, uh, um, an ethical consideration. Let's speak about more principles. Let's speak about the uh, acknowledgement of complexity. If I can acknowledge for myself that the complexity of this world is infinite, or say much higher than I can comprehend as a human being, 
then this means that I don't hold the truth. I just hold an oversimplified model of a perspective. And this model is never the reality. This means if we build models to understand reality, we always fall short. And actually, we as humans have a very good way of abstract thinking and taking the agency to make sense of the world in a new way. But I think we are decades or even centuries away from building models because this is a paradox, right? Which can really understand the full deepness of reality. So this is actually a call for collaboration. This is a call for exchange of perspectives to give us, to give us the opportunity to embody more complexity as a group instead of being limited by one person. Complex systems, uh, you might have heard about it. Who has, re read, like, who has heard about complex system and read about it, what it means? Cool. It's like a little bit less than, I would say, 10 to 15% in the room. Uh, complex systems are systems which are built out of many small aspects, cells. For example, the human body itself is a complex system. And those complex systems, even if you describe every cell, it is pretty much impossible to describe or predict the emerging behavior, which is generated by the interaction between the single elements. And you can ask yourself, um, where is I? Where is my intelligence? Where is my perception for myself? In which cell is this? And I believe that this is an emerging property out of the complex system that all of our cells together create that feeling of me or this feeling of I have intelligence and I hold agency. Uh, when we say that, what does it mean for building governance systems which uh, try to embody collective intelligence and wisdom and allow massive coordination? Jordan Greenhall said that we need a totally entire different model of dealing with the reality, a new frame of mind, a collective intelligence. This is an ability to come into communion with a group and act as a single unit, unit of intelligence. This means that we participate with a larger group without really being able to embody the whole complexity of the group which the group represents, which the group is able to represent or understand through collective intelligence. If we look at what collective intelligence is for Wikipedia, then you come to uh, uh, that graphic. And I found it quite uh, interesting how this maps to the blockchain space. So we have, for example, the area of cognition and market judgment and prediction of the future events in politics and technology. Some of you might have seen that slide before because I used it before. But what do you think, uh, what matches here if you think about a startup in the blockchain space? What startup name would you drop? Yes, yes. Then another one? Gnosis, prediction market. So just as an example, I mean, Augur is there as well. But in general, prediction markets, and this is one example here, uh, we have the aspect of cooperation, which is a network of trust, a peer-to-peer -peer business, and an open source software. What matches this, this description? I would go further. I would agree that this is true for them, but this is also true for distributed ledger technologies and protocols as well, right? So to build a fabric which actually allows us to uh, transact in trust. And then we have coordination, ad hoc communities, coordinating collective action. And this is, I think, what distributed governance is about. It's us learning the functions which help us to coordinate collective action. Because we introduce the hierarchy of systems and protocols instead of the hierarchy of humans. A secondary principle based on uh, complexity is uh, integrating maximum integratable cognitive diversity. So this means if we in this room all think the same because we have the same worldview, we don't have a lot of cognitive uh, diversity. And this means if we look at the problem together, then we come up with the same opinions all the time. 
But if we look back or think back, then reality has many perspectives, right? So I think it is desirable that we have a cognitive serenity, which gives us the ability, so, sovereignty, sorry, which gives us the ability to look from different perspectives to this uh, same problem. So this is the principle of that we want to get the maximum integratable cognitive diversity. And I say integratable because it creates friction. Every time you bring some, somebody in a, a group with a different perspective and a different worldview, this creates tensions. And then the question is, how do you enable cohesion between people which have totally different perspectives? And that's an emotional or, say, a vision thing or a cultural thing, but it's certainly not uh, the aspect of having the same opinion. Digo Foundation was created by, um, by a small group of people, uh, actually uh, uh, Max and uh, Anya, which uh, joined me uh, in the beginning, like right after ECC last year. Uh, Max, do you like to raise your arm? Anya is over there. They helped me a lot like over the last year uh, with the idea that we set up a conference in Athens, a conference to bring together many different people to show that NGOs and technologies which come from the blockchain space can actually uh, provide new governance functions and develop them together. That was very, very ambitious because we were aiming for very high numbers of participants. And in the end, it was not that big event which we could pull, pull off because it was like immense resources. We had a, a crypto winter and we just decided to make a smaller event. After ECC, there was also the, the point where the inspiration hit me so strongly that I said, I need to dedicate time to uh, uh, this very interesting field of distributed governance. And you might remember who, who was there, who was at the stairs conversations last year. Okay, very few. But it was a discussion about uh, what we do with the frozen funds as one aspect, the parity funds. And there were other aspects in this conversation. It was all about governance and was super clear that this in-person communication was super important to actually get more insights about what's the state of the community currently. And if there's something tensionable we can act on. And it showed the lack of additional coordination uh, frameworks. Um, and as, as a response to that, the idea came for Athens and for having this conference in Athens. And it was just a tweet to check how it will resonate. There was a very strong resonation with like over 25,000 people seeing it. And um, as a result of that, it was clear that we need more work in the field of distributed governance. In January, we kicked off the first event in uh, Berlin, uh, which was focused on distributed governance. Um, you find information about this online, uh, but to break it down, it was an event which was self-organized, so not only speaking about distributed governance, but also living it, and which used a lot of social technologies to create cohesion between the participants to allow to integrate a lot of diversity in opinion. And I think this is something we can take as a culture stronger into uh, our communities. If you want updates about future events, it's also on the website, but Athens is not dead, it's just postponed. Let's speak about new concepts. Let's speak about new concepts we currently see rising because of also blockchain technologies, conversations you might have heard before. Who has heard about network societies? Oh, okay. Who has heard uh, about that there is something like a blockchain state, uh, like a blockchain based society or blockchain uh, based post nation state thing? Oh, more people. That's great. So if we look at um, in the corner, there's always this X course with like, um, uh, this is actually German, I'm sorry for that, uh, with, with a person and uh, the, the topic. If you make notes and you're interested in the topics, I highly uh, advocate for just Googling those X course links, which are in the bottom. Um, uh, he speaks about network societies as a social phenomenon that we have uh, now in this time where we live in, the opportunity to gather around ideas and about prin uh, around principles globally without having the separation through borders. And when we look at what blockchain technologies provide us, then it becomes very interesting. We're not there yet, but we develop self sovereign digital identities which allow us to control our data and to allow access. This was something which usually was issued by a state or a state organization. 
So we democratize that. We have money and monetary policy. Hell yeah. We have actually democratized that as well with cryptocurrencies. We have the ability to develop governance processes and set them up in organizational structures like DAOs. Also, done. And we can create a culture. So everything what we usually say makes a state, makes a community which can thrive, is now in reach to build as a network society. So what is distributed governance? It's about the distribution of power. It's about avoiding centralized parties and the risks which they introduce. It's about shared ownership and the ability to participate in the decision making. It's also about allowing that we uh, get way more input. If everybody can engage with a system, that means that everybody can raise issues. In a very complex world, which is moving very dynamically and fast, we need to be able to address those topics with an increasing speed, with an increasing dynamic, and we can't afford to oversee critical issues because we didn't want to, to listen to somebody. Obviously, this creates a lot of questions and problems because we introduce a lot of information to a system and we need to have an opportunity to react to that, right? These are sense-making functions. I will speak more about that, but that's the research we need to do. Aspects for viable distributed governance systems. I think we can discuss this a lot, what we think a viable system is, but for my opinion, it's really that we are changing, for example, to omniconsiderative behavior, like I said before, so that we actually optimize for the maximum of benefits, for the maximum amount of sentinel beings, because we are heavily depending on nature and the animals there, and for the maximum amount of time. And there are more, there's more to that. If you design complex systems, we can actually build anti-fragile systems, which allow us to scale and to integrate without the system breaking down. If you think about global governance systems, then we need exactly that. We need systems where everybody can take agency, which can scale and which are stable and self-stabilizing. Because on that level, stakes are too high to break. But we still need to have the ability to adapt. What is distributed governance for Ethereum? How do we maintain the code? How do we ensure that we uh, introduce new features? And how do we do that with a permissionless blockchain? How do we keep it a permissionless blockchain by avoiding capture? How do we ensure that miners do not collide? So, Kulut, um, this is really about how are we able to scale the development of a platform like Ethereum if we are not able to scale the governance model for it. So, there's a very strong dependency. When we speak about like blockchain, I don't want to limit it to blockchain. We are speaking actually about the infrastructure for Web3. We are actually speaking about that there are different elements which need to be considered. But in general, it's always about scalability, sustainability, and sovereignty. And then we could discuss what this actually in detail means in, in, like in a lot of sessions, actually. If we speak about the vision of Ethereum, there was the Holy Trinity in the beginning, right? And there was the idea that something like Whisper could be a communication protocol, which is unstoppable, which gives us censorship resistance, which ensures that we are actually able uh, to ensure that our messages are delivered uh, while staying anonymous. We have the world computer. Hey, it's there. It's a little bit slow, but it's there, right? But what is with the global storage layer? So those things are very dependent also if we want to get there, that we build systems which can serve as an alternative to existing platforms like Amazon, Google, Facebook. Without those, it's a little bit half-hearted because what's the point if, the, if we are depending still on heavily centralized other aspects of the infrastructure? I want to go a little bit in the legal direction because uh, I'm also participating in the Koala workshops of Primavera di Filippo and want to share my perspective, um, which arose through those participations. I actually think that we created such a territory. Uh, I actually think that the miners which are distributed all over the world create an abstract level which allows us to have a rules or have rules by code. And those, I say, uh, Ethereum jurisdiction 
uh, is actually a sovereign because if we ensure that the governance process for making changes to the code stays not captured, then this means that we can give ourselves rules. And this means that these rules are also enforced against everybody who participates on the platform. Legislation is done by pretty much core developers at the moment because they define what the rules are. And if, uh, yeah, if we want to change them, then we need to change the code. And this is exactly what happened with the DAO fork. But we have also a different element for execution and adoption, which are the miners, because they can actually veto against a change of the protocol, right? Um, and this means that a part of an unchanged protocol continues as a hard fork, or that uh, the core devs might not even consider to pushing it down because the miners are uh, actually not interested in adopting that at all. Uh, about capture, I can highly recommend you to read the Governance 1 1 by Flat Samphir, just for my own curiosity, who has read or read that article. Okay. It gives a little bit of feedback where we are with the discussion and how broad the knowledge is. Um, uh, please read it if you find the time. Um, it is uh, all about what's a permissionless blockchain if it's captured, where's the difference to a private one or to consortium chain. I want to introduce a difference here, a difference between a DAO and the SDO, the software-defined organization. Every DAO is a software-defined organization, but not every software-defined organization is a DAO. And this might be a, a distinction I want to make, but I really feel that there is a big difference because the DAO lives on an independent jurisdiction, the Ethereum jurisdiction, and applies to those rules, while the SDO lives on a private or permissioned chain, which is uh, actually subject to the jurisdiction they inherit. So if I'm Microsoft, I run my cloud uh, service or, uh, services in the US, then I will need to comply to those rules. So if we make the differentiation between SDOs and DAOs, we can actually have more meaningful conversations. And I would be very happy if we could do that <laughs> because there was a lot of confusion around. Where are we at with the current rule of code? When we uh, look at the systems, uh, we are currently having at Ethereum, at Bitcoin, and so on. The state of emergency reveals the power structures we have. And there's a very good paper by uh, um, Angelina uh, Balsch. She actually uh, wrote about uh, deconstructing decentralization. I can highly recommend uh, going through that paper. Uh, it shows uh, those states of emergencies and how decisions were made. And she uh, claims that we actually have pretty centralized systems right now when it comes down to the decision-making, who can propose changes to the code successfully to the platform. So the question is, do we have a metrocracy? Do we have a plutocracy? What do we want to have, actually? Do we want to have direct participation with only win outcomes? I think we need to start to ask more of those questions. Permissionless blockchains as a digital legal system uh, which allows itself to enforce the in the digital domain uh, requires a little bit more things before lawyers would allow this or say consider it a jurisdiction. I'm going here a little bit in the future. It would require a good conflict resolution system to actually decide, for example, what to do with the frozen funds. Question is, can we build distributed ones which help us to bring more transparency and more participation uh, in those decision-making processes? And the question is, how do we process code, which then goes into the protocol? How do we ensure that in a distributed and scalable manner? How do we validate that? And how do we, again, come to the point that we make the best decisions we can make under the circumstances of the information which are available to us? All code which is running currently on Ethereum is subject to the decision-making process of the people which are able to successfully lobby and bring the code into the protocol. Um, this is a very implicit process. I would advocate highly for thinking about how we make a scalable, explicit process out of it. I know that this will take a long time, um, but this would give us the ability to actually make it transparent how decisions are made and how somebody who is currently not working with Ethereum on the other side of the planet, which has no social merit, 
can actually contribute in a positive way to the protocol. So reality check with the status quo. I'm very critical because when we think about we have Airbnb, Uber, Amazon, Facebook, multi-dollar industries, then the question is, the, uh, is if we build something which can compete with those industries, then this means that the stakes are getting higher. This means that we have multi-billion multi dollar incentives to actually privatize or stop this platform. And the question is, if we check in with the core devs today, how do they feel, how much watch they feel, how much pressure they have, because we hold them accountable for being something like legislators and guardians and stewards for the platform. How much more can they take when we speak about multi-billion dollar industries? If we want to withstand such a pressure, we need to get way better at scalable distributed governance processes because this allows us to distribute also the pressure on the people which can propose. This will decrease the power of the single core dev, but it will increase the amount of pressure they can held, hold and it will decrease the responsibility they have. So actually they will have a better life. <laughs> I just want to introduce this. Um, there are some projects like Ocean Protocol, for example, and there are many more, which want to give their protocol to the community. Uh, but they start here. They start as a centralized organization. Some guy came up with an idea, collects some friends around it, forms a team, gets maybe funding from an ICO or private source, continues, launches a testnet, launches a mainnet, goes further, introduces more decentralization for decision-making and participation, collecting feedback from the community, establishing a way to propose features, establishing maybe something like uh, bounty, uh, back bounty systems, which allow us to develop new features outside of the core team. And then we come to the point that the community takes ownership of the network. But this means that the core community, which actually created in the beginning, steps down. And then we decentralize the nodes of power. This is rarely happening, by the way. In the past of like humankind, there were some, some situations where this happened. But the problem is that power tends to corrupt and that it allocates, right? So this is the nature, unfortunately. I'm not sure if Ethereum is here. I'm not sure. Maybe it's, maybe it's a little bit further up there. Maybe it's a little bit further down there. But I'm missing more aspects to ensure that we keep it that way, that we have a tendency to decentralization and not to centralization. What are the actions we can actually take to make good progress with distributed governance systems? First of all, if we don't want to have decision-making based on CPU power or decision-making based on coin holding, then we need to find ways to actually address a human as a being. And the way how we can do that is with self-sovereign digital identity standards and the way to actually prove that you're a unique human being. This is a very hard challenge, uh, but I think uh, that this is something we will not go come around if we really want to have the ability to interact as a human being with those systems. Uh, and I think it's highly desirable that those are standards which are cross-platform. And there are DID standards, there is the web of trust, there are other people which work on this, which have a legacy which can help us to get those things done. Distributed bounty systems are a very good way to actually get started because you have decision making and you have fund allocation. You need to ask yourself how you can hold people accountable. It's a perfect low stack environment to actually um, iterate. And there are actually governments which are willing from democratic countries, are willing to take a part of their budget, of their yearly budget, to try it out with like blockchain based bounty systems so that they can increase engagement with the, uh, with the citizens. So I think that there are more allies we can potentially identify and work with than we might see in the first place. It's very important that we have something like Gitcoin and other projects which help us also to build the code in a distributed way and to allow us to ensure that the tools we need to build those distributed systems uh, are also uh, supporting scalable engagement for coders. Building DAOs which interface with the real world is something uh, we also uh, need to do if we want to have a real world impact, which means, for example, renting projects are a great opportunity there. 
uh, I will just uh, set, okay, just a moment. This is just a combination of multiple of the systems. So this means that we use uh, signaling um, and uh, EIP proposals in the combination with a bounty system and a GitHub-like code management and version control system. And you see on the side that there are different steps. So this is uh, something I will go a little bit deeper later on as well. So we need to have with every organization and with every community to ab the ability to gather signals. So this is perception. They have the ability to make sense out of this and collaborate to make better sense out of it. This is the sense making. And then we have the agency, the ability that we execute. This is the part where we actually decide to allocate the resources and go into action. And then we have the feedback function, which allows us to reason again if what we are actually doing makes sense, to check if it's healthy, to check if what we are doing is bringing the system forward and how can we improve it further. If we want to get a decentralized Airbnb protocol, platform whatsoever, let's start with the specifics. Let's start with renting a house and putting a DAO behind it and figuring out what we need to do there. Not starting with building the whole platform. Because in the second step, we can rent multiple houses and we can increase those systems, but based on real-world applications. Sovereignty, uh, sovereignty is the ability to adapt. We hold those systems actually on ourselves as well. So if you're sovereign, you're able to interact with your world. There are multiple definitions. There are various definitions for this. I will just read out the one from Yuvi Iva Gonova. She said, sovereignty is the cognitive capacity to have clear perception, sense-making, and agency. It is the ability to be a, conscious, uh, be a con uh, concise agent in your life and take responsibility. For me, it's also saying that this is the ability for us to adapt because we make, make, uh, make sense of our environment. If you're interested in like uh, more, say, uh, context, uh, there are two podcasts which are very, very nice, which is Future Thinkers podcast um, about the evolution of consciousness and um, science. And there is Collective Insights podcast, which is about interdisciplinary um, scientists out of the biosphere and medical sphere which speak about complex systems. If we conceptualize that for governance structures, I think we can build um, a classification which we could use in a fractal way on every layer, which means that we can use them on a personal level, but we can use them also to ask ourselves what are the respective functions in a group, in a DAO, or for a civilization, so for a global governance system. And these are about those four steps. It's about perception, like I said before, which creates situational awareness. The better our perception is, the more we can actually take in consideration to make a decision. Which means if I have a lot of, uh, say, I hear something, I see something, I feel something, my brain mixes this to create a situation awareness. And this is very important if we want to make good decisions. Uh, I will go a little bit faster because I'm running out of time. Um, but to make a very important uh, point at this stage in this conversation, talk, there is this part of human agency with intrinsic motivation. If we run through all the different aspects of perception, sense-making, and agency, we are actually uh, reasoning about why we are doing something. If we uh, get very strong extrinsic incentives, we uh, jump through um, the first and second step and go directly to agency. Which means that we don't try to really make sense out of what I'm doing as long as I'm paid. And this is true for also programming people through incentives. So I uh, can only say that I'm uh, not a big fan of that, especially not uh, because this aligns the opinions strongly and decreases the diversity we get from a group. And therefore, we are not able to make very good decisions because the information we get from the people are just always the same. Standard and specifications. Governance is a general topic uh, which has a long legacy. And I think we can discover a lot of governance functions in the real world today. And we are able to use them to actually encode this logic into governance systems on the blockchain, in DAOs, for example. 
Um, and it's very helpful if we do that with specifications and with standards because then we can actually take governance functions, put them into like Aragon, for example, and move them over to DAO stack. Or the other way around, or build a new DAO and adapt those governance functions based on libraries. So if we think about that as libraries, it's great because it means that we are not limited to uh, having specific governance functions, but we can adapt what is available. How are those governance functions intersecting with our belief systems? I, as a human, have my beliefs of this world, and this means that I'm actually always biased. And my ideology actually dictates me to a degree when I'm looking at a crowd, which people I see. If I'm very negative, in a very negative state of mind, for example, I might see the negative like people interacting with each other in a crowd. If I'm very positive, I might see more the people which care for each other. And this is very important to take in consideration that the human operation system we embody, the worldview we embody dictates how we make sense and how we come to conclusions and how we give feedback about what we perceive. And to reflect that back, when we think about that we are grown up as rivalous people, that as rivalous um, uh, agents in a world which is rivalous, then this is probably what we hold. So what do we need to unlearn and what do we need to learn to actually engage in a collaborative way? What's this? It's very hard to see and this is probably like yeah you have not a very good perception right now right so if we increase that we get a little bit more contextual information we, yes that was fast right so the more we increase that the more context we get and with that we get more ability to reason about the situation we are seeing right so if we focus just in the first step to listen more deeply with the people we engage with, then we actually can make better decisions already. But if we are really, really good in collaborating with each other, if we are really good in listening and exchanging diverse opinions, then we get a very good 360 degree perspective. And I think this is what is really desirable if we really want to understand the context we are operating in. And this is pretty much true for like everything we engage with. So I want to come back to the infinite complexity of the world we live in. And when we look at it, yeah, these are a different perspective, right? This is a geostationary orbit of Earth. Here is a low Earth orbit. This is what the ISS sees. And here is an image from a, a satellite which checks actually the, uh, the temperature. So we have an interest for good decision making to get as much possible uh, possible input um, uh, as much input as possible i need to do a short time check how much time do i have left five minutes so when we speak about governance structures it's important to actually acknowledge that we have natural hierarchies and that's not a bad thing because there are the hierarchies of people and there are the hierarchies of system we have various hierarchies we are aware of. So this is a very standard hierarchy you might know. And this is a very direct participatory hierarchy, right? Everybody can engage with everybody. This is a very flat hierarchy which allows uh, the people which engage directly with each other to have a lot of advisors which help them. This could be like a board actually. But at the same time, they are interacting in a hierarchy which is very, very strong. So we all are in different hierarchies all the time. We form groups based on purpose, goals, and identity, usually, if we are not motivated by extrinsic incentives. And when we form groups with friends, then we are actually selecting our leaders in a very um, uh, friendly way. We acknowledge their competence. And those uh, which serve the group um, uh, try to help them. So, for example, if we go mountaineering and there is a guy called Max, which is actually a very professional mountaineer, then I uh, will agree to his leadership if I'm uh, acting from the base of his experience and I am not experienced. And there might be a, a person called Sarah, which is also a little bit experienced, which supports Max with that leadership. And that's not a bad thing. 
I think this is something we should acknowledge that this is something which is not desirable to try to eliminate that. We have that in various situations. So while Max is a good mountaineer, Phil is our driver. So he is the f in the friends group, is the guy who races, who has a lot of experience with driving. So we let him drive. And we have Sarah, which is the dive instructor. So when we go diving, she's the leader. I think you get the picture. So this means distributed governance or horizontal structures allow us that we have many leaders which step up in different contexts, which allow us to uh, actually leverage the best potential available. But that's a situation out of servantship, out of stewardship. So hierarchies of systems actually allow us to uh, eliminate the need for hierarchies of people which become dangerous because a lot of people depend on one person. So if we try or if we are able to avoid a lot of dependencies in a hierarchy, this will give us the ability to actually eliminate the risks there as well. But we need to have systems which uh, give us the hierarchy we need to actually, uh, for example, govern us globally. If we don't find some basic principles, we are not able to coordinate globally. But if we use subsidiary systems uh, and the, the hierarchy of systems we can freely, freely engage with, then I think it becomes a little bit clearer what I'm speaking about here. So distributed governance systems give us the ability to move freely horizontal and to engage with any other system freely. But the groups we form or how many groups we form or how we split them again, this is something which is totally arbitrary which is really down to the people which want to work together and is something which is not determined by the system itself. We are experimenting as well with governance structures. Um, we are building a DAO which is based on intrinsic motivation instead of incentive systems because we want to show that this is possible as well. This is currently in a conceptual state and as my close to the last point, a short summary and then the last point, uh, I believe that we will not have scalable governance uh, without a scalable blockchain, permissionless blockchain, which gives the uh, substrate for building the systems. But at the same time, we will not see uh, um, a scalable uh, distributed, uh, distributed blockchains without uh, distributed governance. So this is like a loop. They need each other and they rise together or fall together. Viable distributed governance is about building complex systems. This means that we design not everything, but we design the basic atomic parts of it, and then we see emerging uh, patterns, which allow us to see emerging patterns of collective intelligence and wisdom. And it actually starts with the way how we interact with each other, so the culture we hold. Are we acting rivalous or are we acting as collaborators on something? And how can we unlearn and learn what is required to build the social fabric required to have uh, to embody a collective intelligence? And I can only say that I participated in trainings and in events where I had the feeling that collective intelligence was arising. And that's really, really weird. It's like something is there, but you cannot really comprehend it totally. And I think it's probably very similar for ourselves, what they think about us. As a last opportunity to engage very closely or soonish, it's, uh, there is a DGOV community assembly, uh, assembly um, end of this week, uh, on March 8th. Uh, actually, this is not organized by the DGOV Foundation, but uh, people which came to Berlin decided that they want to set something up, and uh, the DGOV Foundation supported it. Um, so if you're interested in those topics, if you're interested in the social governance and deepening those conversations, uh, you're invited and uh, just let me know if you need a link and uh, you get it. If you uh, search it, it's also on the DGOV Twitter. It's a little bit older. Check like three or four tweets behind and there's a registration link. All right, that's it. I, yeah, thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? Could you further explain why self-sovereign identity standard is one of those requirements or plans of action 
Yes, if we want to do uh, Asian-centric governance, then we need to be able to map uh, a person to the blockchain space. And self digital identity standards uh, are giving us the protocols to uh, actually do that without a centralized authority. So, because we don't want to have oppression by authorities, we want to use open standards which give everybody the ability to, credi to give credibility to others, like a web of trust, right? Uh, but at the same time, the beauty of self sovereign digital identity protocols is that they would support giving uh, currently existing uh, ID structures. So a government, for example, could issue a claim uh, of uh, a government ID to a self sovereign digital identity, or a, a corporation could do the same. So it's, it's uh, legacy compatible, but gives us way more opportunities for uh, uh, control and uh, agency. More questions? So, so there's, uh, there's, yeah, okay, perfect. If you go afterwards. Hi. Uh, so, Hi. I'm, I'm just curious to, to hear what are your thoughts would be on the, kind of the next steps, the things that you think that are uh, both important and are close to be emerging uh, in the near future. So when we speak about IT systems, we usually model real-world behavior. And I think the most important thing is that we get reliable emerging collective intelligence in a non-digital context so that we identify the patterns which are required to model this and build IT systems which support that. Right? So it starts with uh, what is the difference if I take a DAO and governance functions for a DAO what is the difference between uh, uh, agents which have a human OS which is rivalrous, between agents which have a human OS which is collaborative? And what, how, how different do they interact with that DAO and how different is the result? Because I think so long uh, or to, until this point it was game theoretic thinking that we can just program the people, but I think that there is way more to it and that we, start, that we need to start to take that into consideration, how people think. There's another question down there. Okay. It sounds like to me uh, like Nash Equilibrium. Uh, are you aware of any research paper linking the blockchain and the game theory? Uh, can you repeat the last part okay. of the question? Uh, the game theory, are you aware of, of what it is? Yeah, yeah, game theory, okay. sure. So, so because it, it sounds like uh, blockchain is an operative way to reach this Nash equilibrium that which is being explained by this uh, game sure. theory. This this works for uh, for very trivial things like uh, if we want to incentivize the security of the network through, uh, for example, running a node because you're rewarded for that. Uh, but it's for us very short if we want to introduce way more complexity. So I'm I'm totally fine with saying you know we use incentive structures to share costs and to reward people for providing infrastructure for us. I think it is uh, a strong fallacy to think that we are able to get the full complexity of this world uh, into a game theoretic model because the game theoretic model itself limits the complexity we can you know, introduce. Um, so so it's, it, it limits the ability of, of you making an independent decision because you will have extrinsic motivations which tell you that's okay and that's not okay or which say, I reward you for this behavior and I don't reward you for this behavior. We have systems which do that very good. And for example, Facebook exploits user uh, attention through hyperstimuli um, uh, based, uh, uh, you know, based on extrinsic incentives by just giving you what you want to have, right? So I think we are very good in using game theory for making people addicted, but I think that this is not desirable. So we, uh, I think, need to differentiate between what is desirable and what is not desirable because I don't want to have my kids being programmed by some people which think that they understand the world, right? More questions? Okay, thank you all for your attention.